the thing I was just going to say about design, I came across a thing where, where he said, you know, there were, in, in the century in which he lived, arguments for God from design, some were famous. I mean, this is when uh, William Paley wrote his uh, work on natural theology, I think, and, you know, famously said, look, organisms are different from rocks. I mean, organisms are more like pocket watches in terms of intricacy yeah, and function. Yeah. And we know the pocket watches have a designer, so organisms must have. Hume did not contest that, which is actually, interestingly, even Richard Dawkins doesn't contest that. I mean, Dawkins says, yeah, animals were designed just not by God. They were designed by natural selection. And Hume, in a way, says something kind of analogous. He says, like, he says, okay, it's one thing to infer design, but you have to be careful in what you can infer about the designer. Right. So, you know, so even if you uh, if you accept that, okay, an animal must have been designed by something pretty smart, that doesn't mean we're talking about the God of Christianity or something, and that which was the kind of of, right. uh, of step that Paley wanted to take. Well, look, the design arguments never ever got you beyond anything like a rudimentary deism. I mean, I mean that that's the reason why. You know, I think in every single debate I ever saw Hitchens do with theists, he would always sort of, you know, especially with William Lane Craig, who would constantly trot out these cosmological arguments, Hitchens would always say, great, even if I grant you all of that, all your work is still ahead of you, right? Um, because that doesn't get you even close to some anthropomorphic giant man in the sky who talked to the Hebrews and, you know, sent his, you know, sent, sent his son down to get, to get crucified and all of that. Um, um, the, the notion that, you know, and in that sense, the medieval theologians, I think, were a lot smarter than the contemporary ones. I mean, a, a Thomas Aquinas knew perfectly well that that by itself didn't get you Jesus of Nazareth, right, and, and all of the rest. Um, 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 and even Anselm, much earlier, I think, probably uh, wouldn't have fallen prey to that sort of mistake. Um, um, right. I, I, I'm, I'm probably not even as, as inclined as Dawkins to even ascribe design to subscribe design even in the minimal sense, but you know, you and I have argued about that also. So that's no. Well, no that's a question of language. No reason to bore people with that again. No, I mean it's a question. I think just think it's a question of language. I mean, natural selection clearly, the creative process of natural selection is very different from the creative process that created a rock, and it leads to this sort of uh, functional integration yeah. uh, that. And, and, and teleological behavior on the part of the organisms, goal-seeking behavior on the part of the organisms, that in other contexts we do associate with design. But whether you want to use the term, uh, as some people do, or use it in quotes or whatever, that doesn't really uh, Yeah, it doesn't matter, matter that much. To me. You, you're, you're not employing it to make theistic arguments. and so. Well, no, I do. One thing I do think is, uh, is and this is uh, what's... It, it's interesting. I mean... I do think that natural selection itself, if you just look at the entire history of evolution on this planet, I think we've talked about this, it has, if you just step back, if you can extract yourself enough to really look at what it would look like to just observe natural selection and time lapse, if you didn't know anything about it, you just saw it proceed on this planet and all of a sudden you're where we are. I mean, it, it generate first it triggers cultural evolution in humans. You get to where we are, you just start to, this planetary brain seems to be emerging in the form of the internet. You know, I think an observer would go, whoa, that's kind of, A, a it's amazing. B, it's kind of like, um, it, it has something in common with the way an organism develops. So I think you could believe that natural selection, and again, I mean natural selection, nothing spooky, not intelligent design, just nuts and bolts natural selection, you could argue that that may have been in set, set in motion in some sense uh, to reach a goal, achieve a purpose. And so in that sense, there may be purpose. Now, what's, what's interesting here is, as you note, that doesn't mean it, it, that doesn't get you an interventionist God. In fact, I mean, it might get you a deistic God. Uh, the truth is, it doesn't even necessarily get you that. I won't elaborate. But, right. but what's interesting to me is even though uh, granting, hypothetically, some sort of purpose to natural selection doesn't get you any very precise place theologically. It totally freaks almost everyone out who in the in the modern kind of scientific community. They just don't yeah. want to hear well, it. They and, and, and they refuse to entertain. They refuse yeah. to listen. They literally refuse to listen to the argument. Right, because they immediately leap to the theistic conclusion and they assume that that's what this is about. And 
I mean, my reaction to it is very different. Different. I mean, uh, to me, these are, you know, in a sense, what we talked about last time, Didion-esque stories. Yeah. You know, to me, the key is when you say, if an observer, and my, my, what I would want to say, an observer like us were to look at this, they would say, oh, wow, this is really... But to me, that says everything about the observer and nothing at all about the thing being observed. Well, okay. Um, but, but that's our difference. I mean, that's the... Okay, you know, but, but I would just point out that the argument I'm making, the, the logic of that argument, is the logic held by Dawkins in the book The Blind Watchmaker. Yeah, he doesn't apply it to natural selection, yeah. but it's exactly the same logic, and he's exactly the kind of purpose person who'd be totally freaked out if he took his own logic and just yeah. and just changed yeah. the context. And I'm I just saying, right. I'm just saying that a lot of people who's who now make a living by preaching the virtues of reason. Yeah. And dismissing religious people as irrational themselves when they sense some argument is threatening are just as irrational and closed minded. Oh, that's absolutely sure true. I, I, I loved um on the old meaning of life site, the original one, uh, you got Dan Dennett to admit this. Well, uh, he says he didn't, but I, I won't watched get into it. That. He explicitly admitted it. I uh, watched well, it. my okay. view is what he said adds up to it. On video. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, I, I you know, I, I, I think I mean he just twisted himself in this in the ensuing email exchange, which is he, online, you can find he it. Twisted himself he just twisted himself himself in knots. It just right. made no sense what he was saying. Once I pointed out to him that that what he said was tantamount to acknowledging that there is at least some evidence that evolution has purpose, he totally freaked out. He heard from his flock of admirers that he had committed heresy and the ensuing email exchange. And, you know, there will be commenters who scream at me for being yeah. a jerk. Go read the damn thing. Read no, it I, carefully. I read it. It and makes you know, no sense. And I'm not friendly to your view on this. I, know. I read it and I watched it. And he said, yes, when you, you have flat out asked him. And he said, yes. Well, In that sense, he said, yes. Yeah. Well, there's a little uh, bit of I mean, you have to. He said yes to two things. And I didn't do a good enough job in the interview of saying, you realize what this adds up to. But but anyway, that's all laid out. If you right. go, we can link to that and, and we can link to the email exchange. I really... The worst thing that ever happened to Dennett was becoming a public intellectual. That was the worst thing. <laughs> and especially becoming one of the four, four horsemen. In my opinion, he hasn't written a really good book since Brainstorms. But, um, in, but his, in his defense, I'll say he does not have some of the properties of the other four horsemen. That he's not ob he's not as obnoxious because he's still too classy of a guy, right? And too much of an intellectual to go that and, far. And, and he understands that even if you consider, uh, you know, like as many people naturally do, like uh, you know, freelance jihadism a big problem. He understands. That probably going around saying, "Don't you Muslims understand that God doesn't exist?" is not a very productive. It's not the way to solve the problem. 